the brainwashing continues there. Like, I'm like, does my family not fucking love me? Do my friends not give a shit about me? I, I believed this. Hello, it's Chevy Moran. I always feel so awkward in the very first few minutes of making a video for the first time in a long time because it feels like I'm trying to, it feels like bumping into an old friend and then like being like, hey girl, yeah, I'm great. But I have the most perfect thing for you today that I think is going to be, it's gonna suck to, it's actually gonna be great to talk about, but it's gonna suck to try to like relive this story and you know, go through my camera roll and go through my brain to recollect exactly what had happened in this certain situation. So for those of you who don't know, in the past, I have had troubles with substance abuse with DRUGS and alcohol. I mean, I, look, I don't know what YouTube's policy is now. I just want to start this off positively by saying I am now a year sober. I'm extremely happy and healthier than I was a year ago. Um, and I plan to be like this for the rest of my life. And if you need help or you're struggling with anything um, like that, please check any resources that are in the description because help is out there. And I know it's very difficult when you're in such a you know dark and vulnerable place, but um, I love you. So this is the first time that I started to realize that alcohol was affecting my life negatively. Like it wasn't always just like, oh my God, we're going to the club. Like I did something crazy last night. No, baby, I was like, waking up in different locations that I should not have been in. It was not cute. And then it was affecting depression, anxiety, etc. So I was just like in an endless cycle. So I decided to go to a medical detox center. So for those of you who don't know much about substance abuse with alcohol, your body becomes physically dependent on it. So for you to get off of alcohol safely when you're in a vicious cycle with it, it's recommended to go somewhere where they medically wean you off of it using medication um, or to actually slow down the drinking day by day until you reach zero because stopping abruptly can lead to something very, very scary called delirium tremens and seizures and people die very, very often from stopping alcohol abruptly. So basically that's what I did. Wow, this video is intense already. So I need to like, take a deep breath. I stumble my cute little ass. <laughs> into the detox and honestly it wasn't that bad they made it a pretty painless experience but there was a head bitch in charge of the entire detox company so basically the plan after you detox is to send someone to like a 30 or 60 or 90 day treatment center first of all i i realized i had an issue with alcohol but i wasn't fully sold on the idea of alcoholic i mean like in my heart of hearts yeah i definitely knew like it wasn't gonna end well so i was just like oh i'm 21 like this is just gonna be me like for a bit like i'm just crazy like you know just growing up and then it just like never stopped and you know basically that's what led me there but i was incredibly busy this was a time in my life where a lot of different things were going on. I was filming Tana's show for MTV. We were going to the VMAs in New York City. Like all of this amazing stuff was coming up and I couldn't miss it. Like I, I like I just, I do wish I, I, I went somewhere inpatient, which inpatient is like, like, a, like a facility where you stay. But I decided to go the route of concierge rehab. Like there's a concierge service for absolutely everything in Los Angeles, your nails, your hair, your filler, your laser hair removal, your lashes. Like, so they had a, they come to you. Like, like I had a rehab come to me and this was recommended by the owner of where I detoxed. One of the workers was like, Hey, I have like the girl, like the owner of the detox on the phone. She wants to speak with you about like what you're doing next. I thought that the concierge rehab was a terrific idea. I was like, Oh, I think that that's amazing that they're going to work around my schedule. I get to go do the VMAs. I get to go film the MTV show. I get to, you know, start working on more music and be like, it, like it seemed so great in my head, but now looking back, obviously it was way, 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 way too fucking good to be true. At the end of the phone call where she was basically telling me that she'd be my head therapist, um, 
for this concierge treatment. I keep putting air quotes and you'll see why later. I'm like, and the story hasn't even started yet. The lady shows up to my house that I lived in, in Hollywood. And I was like, oh my God, fun, rehab at home. Fucking stupid. Honestly, it was so much money. I want to say it was somewhere in between like 20 to $30,000 a month. And honestly, for a nice rehab, that's pretty typical because a lot of the nice ones don't take insurance. But like, I didn't have and man of these, I didn't have a fucking spa. And she was relatively like, okay, right? She was, she had very large personality. Um, I wish I could have fixed her makeup a little bit because I was like, what is going on with your lips, bitch? But like, besides like all the physical stuff, like she seemed pretty cool and down to, you know, work through some shit. And that's basically all I needed to do. We start working through it and things start to like feel okay. About on the third therapy session where this lady came over to my house, First of all, this is like me, like, like we're supposed to like get me sober here, right? We end the therapy session and she just, she stops and she goes, Trevi, how old are you? And I'm like, I'm, I'm 21. At the time I was 21, now I'm 23. She takes a long pause and she goes, wow, you're so young. There's no way you could be an alcoholic. And was basically selling me this idea that because of my age, I didn't have to fully stop drinking. That should have been a huge red flag for me. But for me, you know, I did obviously want to drink again because it was honestly the only thing that was helping my anxiety. So instead of feeling alarmed that she said this, I'll be completely honest, I was kind of stoked. I was like, okay, shit. Maybe I'm not, because I was scared of this word, like alcoholic, alcoholic, alcoholic. You know, maybe I'm not one of them. And I, first of all, I don't know why I was so scared to take on and understand what the disease of addiction is and identify with it and try to get myself help from it. But that in itself is a whole different thing. I shit you not, I shit you the fuck not. So the next time she comes over, so my rehab, essentially, she comes over to my house after that session with a bottle of tequila. No, God, please, no, no! With a bottle of tequila, like my rehab, like try to, try to, under, like try to picture it in this way. You try to get yourself help, your family, your friends are worried about you. You go detox, you spend seven days in a fucking bed medically detoxing off of something that could kill you by the withdrawals. And then after you're finished getting that out of your body, you're walking into a rehab facility and they welcome you at the door with a silver platter and a fucking tequila bottle. That's, that's insane, right? So I guess like basically what she was trying to do was analyze my drinking habits and to test me and see how bad of an alcoholic I was. For all moral and ethical reasons, that is extremely fucked up. This isn't a science experiment, first of all. I came to you, my family came to you for help. The weirdest part for me is that she was drinking with me. We, it, it's like we returned, like we did, so we started doing therapy, like the way that we were doing before, but we started doing it drunk. And that's when things took an also like very, very, very weird turn because then she began to make my therapy sessions all about her and start crying about her problems. And then she's, you know, dumping, dumping and ranting all of this onto me. This lady is not my friend. I hired this medical professional, what I thought was a medical professional, to, ass to assist me in my issues because that is what you said you fucking specialized in. And now here you are sitting on my couch with a bottle of tequila, drunk crying about your life, which was supposed to be a therapy session. Absolutely blows my fucking mind. This wasn't a set 30, 60, 90 day sort of rehab deal. This company was subscription based. So it was a monthly thing. You could cancel your subscription. You could do one month. You could do two months. You could do three, right? I got to the point where I was pretty fucking brainwashed and pretty, I, I mean, I, I fully got back into the cycle of alcohol and then, you know, seeing her escalate she started to come over every single day when it used to be twice a week she came over every single day to either get me drunk or drink with me i'm just realizing what i just said like i cannot believe 
bullshit. That is bullshit. And I know that she's done this to other people too because I've talked to some of the other clients. I look fucking incredible. Thank God. I noticed she started to increase the amount of time she was seeing me, giving me alcohol, yada, 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 because she wanted me to renew the subscription. So it was like another twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. And why I said yes still blows my mind. I have to do things like forgive myself and I, I cannot put this sort of situation and my decisions on me. I cannot blame myself because I was in a fully altered state of consciousness that I was supposed to be out of. So I renewed the subscription. She started coming over every day, but she would like balance me out, like try to get me better again. She would like have someone come over and give me a vitamin IV in my arm. Oh, like just sip this cocktail while you're doing it. Like, oh my God, don't you feel so much better? And like just fully like just using me as sort of like this source of income, like taking my worst vulnerability and the worst part about me and fully rising it to the surface for her own profit is, I've never said it that way and I am actually nauseous. So since I was so out of my goddamn mind, like I, we started getting into the conversation of, you know, my friends and my family and, you know, all of my close personal relationships. Well, she got to a consensus, right, after I was speaking and she looked me dead in the eyes <laughs> And she's like, so I don't think that any of your friends or your parents really like love you or care about you. The only person I, I and th this, is, this is me trying to like imitate her. She's like, the only person that I think really knows you and cares about you and understands what you're going through right now is me. The brainwashing continues there. Like, I'm like, does my family not fucking love me? Do my friends not give a shit about me? I, I believed this. I believed that everything she was saying was true. And it feels sort of cultish now because it's, instead of like a cult, in like a cult way, like instead of me worshiping or idolizing or being part of some collective, it was literally, she eventually turned it into a personal obsession instead of a money obsession. So she became obsessed with the idea of me and the idea of, you know, online fame. And you know, if we would go out to eat and someone would come up and recognize me, she was obsessed with that. And, um, she would tell me all this time about how when she was my age, she was, you know, this really, really amazing, like, singer and songwriter. And, like, every time I tried to Google her, like, nothing came up. I don't know if she ever changed her name. I don't know if her entire identity or certificate is based off of a fake name. I'm only starting to revisit this subject because I have started to heal with actual real therapists and treatment centers and um, group therapy and meetings and all of things like that. So I, I'm feeling a lot less afraid to speak up and start to take action on it. A lot of the days, a lot of the days were the same. She'd come over, she'd black me out and then like not tell me and then just like sleep in the bed with me. This is what I'm saying about the obsession. And I remember one time I woke up out of a blackout. Like I fell asleep during a blackout and then I woke up and like she was there shaving my legs because I started to tell her about, you know, my plans to transition and obviously I wasn't physically transitioning yet. And she was so obsessed with this idea. So she started to shave my legs to make me look more like a woman. Why is a razor blade with a handle that is shaving off hair that is naturally grown going to make me any more of a woman? Like I think if I'm going to start my transition, like I'm gonna go see a fucking doctor and go get on hormones. Like, I don't need you shaving my fucking legs while I'm black the fuck out. Like, like first of all, why am I blacked out? Um, oh, I'm getting pissed. <laughs> my mom's downstairs, she probably hears me. She's like, get her bed. I kind of didn't say anything because I, I started to become very, very afraid of this woman. I had a song coming out called Crisis that I really was so proud of because it was the first song I wrote really honestly and vulnerably about my problems with the substance. So she's like, let's throw a release party. And I'm already like sketched out by this bed. She's like, I'll pay for it. And I'm kind of thinking in my head, I was like, oh, like a little release party. Thinking that like, I was gonna be allowed to like invite friends. But then I remember that she told me that she hates all my friends and all my friends hate me. Um, you know, even like didn't invite family members. Like she said, you can invite one friend. And so I invited my friend Makoa, who she told me didn't love me, but she's like, I'll let it slide. So she rents out this suite 
I walk into this suite. First of all, it wasn't like a nice, nice hotel in Beverly Hills. It was just a hotel located in Beverly Hills that was looked pretty sketchy to say the least, like kind of like people that are like meeting up from like apps and fucking. At least put me in like the Waldorf Astoria because this is giving like, I'll destroy ya. <laughs> Honestly, Slay, I'm a songwriter. Anyway, so we walk in, there's rose petals leading to the bed. There's one bed in this whole fucking suite that she was supposed to sleep with me in. The rose petals, like don't, like ro that has nothing to do with my fucking song. Anyway, there is a fucking ice chest of two huge bottles of Grey Goose vodka and three large, like 750 milliliter champagne bottles, Moe and Chandon. I'll never forget it to this fucking day. And I go, wait, so it's just me, you, my homeboy, Makoa, and then her coworker. It was four people. That was enough alcohol for probably a party of 50 to 100 people. I mean, maybe I'm not doing that math right in my head. Depends on, you know, what kind of party you're having. Why the fuck is there that much alcohol in this hotel room? For a song release about my problems with alcohol. And I, I did. I got extremely hammered that night. And she woke me up. She knew that I was going to go into withdrawals. So she put a vodka orange juice in my face. She goes, drink up. Don't want you to start shaking. Wow. So this leads me to the last, the, the last portion of the story. We are in my apartment and we're on the couch having a therapy session and she's crying about her life again. It, it never, like it, towards the end, it never became about me. It all became about her and her just being absolutely twisted and um, having the most ill of intentions. So after she's like crying, I just, I'm over it. I'm, I'm fucking done. I finally, finally put my foot down. All of those things that she said to me were starting to clear up. I'm like, I don't think any of my fucking family doesn't love me. Like, who, like, anyway. So I go, okay, I think we're done for today. She was extremely offended by me closing off the session. She refuses to leave my apartment. So I lock myself in my bathroom I lived alone, so this is, in a, this is when shit got pretty physical and verbally abusive and very, 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 very dark. Um, I'm locking, locking myself in the bathroom, I'm crying, I'm screaming, get the fuck out. She would throw shit around my apartment, have makeup, like I was hearing it hit the wall from when I was locked inside the bathroom, like that's when things got pretty physical and terrifying. I probably would be able to, with the Adrenaline that I had to fucking drag that bitch out the fuck of my apartment, okay? But I didn't. So I finally get her out of the apartment and then I lock the door immediately. She was sitting outside my door, weeping, crying, banging on my door, saying whatever she thinks would make me go, okay, I'm gonna let you back in, let's talk. To basically suck me back in. Like a psycho fucking ex. Babe, reality check. You're an evil and pathetic excuse for a human being. And that is probably the meanest thing I've ever said in my life. But if you are watching this right now, which I'm sure you are, don't ever fucking do that again to anyone because I will fucking find out and I will make sure you will end up not on a couch crying. You will be crying on the floor behind metal bars. Slay. So it's not over yet, it's not over yet. I eventually called security to remove her. They did, she gets out of the building. And honestly, I don't know why this was my one fucking thought, but I just go, I wanna get the fuck out and go get a burger. I wanna get a burger. Like, I, I haven't, I feel like I haven't eaten, like there's nothing in my stomach but alcohol. So I went to go get a burger, a fucking fat burger or some shit, <laughs> okay? It was incredible, duh. But then I come back to my apartment. Okay, this is a nice building. Like you need two key fobs. Like you need one key fob to get into the building and you need another key fob to get up the elevator. She breaks into the building somehow. Somehow either someone let her in with their fob, but then she makes it into the elevator, goes up to my floor, goes to my apartment, breaks in, 
because when I walk into my apartment, I see her shoes on the floor and I hear her walking around upstairs. If there was like a living room area and then my bedroom was upstairs. I hear her footsteps. Do what? Why the fuck are you in my apartment? Why the fuck did you break into my apartment? What the fuck is going on? Like, you have passed a level of illegal, first of all, but absolutely batshit. You have crossed, you crossed the line probably the third time I ever fucking met you, but you have absolutely gone way too far and there is nothing you could do and there is nothing you could say that could make me a judge. There is nothing you could say now. Like, you have crossed a fucking line. I felt incredibly unsafe after I had security remove her again. Anyway, I ended up at a hotel. And that's where I slept. And I haven't spoken to her since that day. She has tried to text me and she has tried to contact me in various ways. But I have all of that. I have audio and video and pictures and um, stuff like that. So, now that fucked me up, right? After that entire thing blew over, I probably continued drinking and then I introduced more drug lifestyle into my life. Um, it's insane that I initially was open and curious to the idea of recovery and this entire experience pushed me farther down, damaged me, and fucked me up. Like it traumatized me for fucking real. Like, and I, I don't use that word very lightly. Like this was a terrible experience. I'm so fucking happy that I get to sit here. Be serious, but laugh, remember, talk with sincerity and clarity and say to you, I am so fucking proud of myself that I, no matter what fucking happened, at the end of the day, I'm sitting here one year clean from drugs and alcohol. And like, I never really thought I would be able to do that. Now I'm just like, I, it's so okay for me to just be like, you know what, I fucking ro I'm rocking the shit out of this. I'm killing it. So thank you for listening. That's my story. Now the TED Talk's over. Woo! Um, I'd love to hear what you guys have to say about this story. And I honestly, don't fucking call me dumb. Like, look, we all know I was fucking drunk the entire time. I just am curious about, like, I just want to see your reactions, to be quite honest. And I did release a song on my one year of sobriety, so to celebrate, that's what I basically did as a gift to myself. I released that, um, it's called Too Hot To Be This Hungover. It's my favorite song I've ever written, babe! It's so good! I made it with a friend named Gregory Dillon in New York City, and it is just a sobriety summer pop rock synth anthem. You know, it, even if you're not an alcoholic, you can relate to the sentence, I'm too hot to be this hungover. I put my sobriety into this song. So, <laughs> please, in the theme of all of this, go listen to that as well. And I love you very much. Please be sure to follow me on all my socials. Give this video a thumbs up, share with your friends, comment. Good to see you, babe. It's been such a pleasure. I love you. Um, I will always love you. Once again, I say this and I will keep saying this. Thank you for sticking with me all of these years. I fucking love every single one of you. And um, yeah, very grateful for life right now. Okay, bye.